Hey, this is Dr. Drew, and you are listening to This Life with Bob Foy and Dr. Drew. Here we are. Ladies, gentlemen, boys, and girls, gather around. It's another episode of This Life. So get your iPad out and put your uh, whatever those little thing, those little earplugs you put in your ears. Uh, AirPods. I, what are they called? AirPods. 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 Put the AirPods in. And another episode of This Life with Dr. Drew and Bob and Shelly. And Shelly's sitting in with us again, which we really appreciate, Shelly. Hi, Shelley. guys. And you may have to, to be here. You may have to run out at some point. Yes. Yeah, so you're welcome to. So we Thank are you. joined by a special guest, Lana Turner, comedian, actress, singer. Uh, she was married to Ralphie May, who was one of my favorite comics. And um, you, you, wait a minute, where did you guys meet? What do you mean, Ralphie and I? Yeah. We met in Houston. Okay. So like I, 20 years ago. What am I reading about Last Comic Standing? What do you mean? She and Ralphie. Who, oh, Ralphie was the that was on last. Yeah, comic Ralph standing. was on last comic. Yeah, uh, okay, that's where his it. career like took off. Took off. Yep. And we watched your one hour stand up special called "So I Wrote a Song About It." Yeah. Some of your stuff is so goddamn funny. I know. Thank it's so you. Funny. I mean, it's. I mean, seriously. <laughs> like, yeah, I you. was like, that's like Ralphie level. <laughs> that to me is like really <laughs> important. That's like as funny as it gets. Well, it's kind of um, tough because sometimes you'll meet. The spouse of somebody who's yeah. successful, but I'm a legitimate comedian. Well, which I was always... thinking about that, how, how hard that must be for you. But but your writing, your writing is so funny. Do you, do you write for television or anything? Um, I don't. I've written some projects, but, you know, I always joke I was the woman behind the man. You just couldn't see me back there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. But, you know, I had, <laughs> so I had the funny. blessing, though, of being able to be a comedian for many, many years and not, not have to be in front of the, you know, big... Thing. I don't have to be in the limelight. I could just do what I love to do and raise children. Yeah. And that's unusual for a female comedian. Yes. And so I've been very, very blessed in that way. But... So you don't have the full female comedian <laughs> spectrum. Well, a lot of women aren't able to have babies in our business because, you know, it, it, it's just, it's really hard to it's do it consuming. all. too consuming. Yeah, but I, I was able to have children and, and now I have to work a lot more, and I have no other skill set outside of dick jokes, so I have to figure this out fast. You should be right. Well, they should be but, very popular at this point. No, they're, I mean it's like it's very like popular with me. Thank yeah, you, Shelly. Did you did you watch her special? You just I, I did, I did, yeah. and I watched your your late husband as well. And like, oh. I'm sorry, but I just think it's it's just. It's so funny, and in a time where there's not a huge amount of laughter. Oh. Yeah, what yeah. Ralphie could do. I'm sorry. I hope we don't mind. I oh, like talking Ralphie as oh, much no. as you. Oh no, I mean Ralphie because I miss him. I miss I him, miss and him I, I don't know if you know. We we I was walking down the street in Las Vegas with a friend of mine. I was like, Oh, jeez, he's at Bally's. We got to go see him. I literally ran across the street <laughs> and met up with him that night, and Aww. that was and he was gone very soon after that. It was just well, we did a podcast the night of the memorial, right? Yeah, we did. We did. It was weird. And Drew had to leave early. I'm so sorry about yeah. all this. But oh, were you, I, the, mo- the memorial is a blur for me. So, I, I mean, people continually come up and like, oh, yeah. we saw you at the memorial. I'm like, I don't remember. Yeah, I, I was at a distance, believe me. Yeah. Uh, and- Drew got there late, so yeah. don't worry. <laughs> I, it wouldn't have mattered to me. I yeah. honestly, like some of my best friends talked to me that night, and I, I don't remember even talking to them. Was, and and as, as horrible as it was, it wasn't. It's not like anyone went, oh, my God, that's impossible. Right. What a went, surprise. Yeah, that wasn't yeah. A surprise. Talk to us about that. About it, which we, part? I, I never really knew. Well, I don't, I don't want to divulge any confidences or anything, but I really didn't really – I never – he never let me into that piece. As, and I, and I, I had a very sort of friendly relationship with him. Right. But I don't know really what he was struggling with. I really don't know. Oh. I just could see it. I just didn't know what it was. Yeah, I mean, he was – really really good at hiding his yeah. addictions i mean yeah. the most obvious one is the food addiction which um i didn't understand that for many many years when i first met him 20 years ago i was he he actually we were friends first and he sat me down and he was like you're thin will you help me lose weight and i was so naive to addiction that i was like you know two and a half pounds a week right you know that and and i i said to him at that time i go please don't ask me to do something that you're not sincere in wanting to do because once you ask me, I will never stop trying to help you. Mm. If I commit to this, you have to be equally as committed. And he was like, no, I really want to. And I was like, put away the ranch. we we'll start right now. Mm. And uh, like 17 years later, I was like, oh my God. Um, but I never, I rarely saw him eat anything that was that exceptional, but you would see evidence of it. Like one time, the worst one I ever saw was... Um, I, I kept sugar and stuff out of the house. And uh, so he would have to use when I wasn't around. He'd have to go someplace and he would sneak out. 
And I was like, are you having an affair or are you eating a cheeseburger? Like, I don't know what's going on. It makes you crazy. Um, but I found the kids had a birthday party and I bought some M&Ms from Costco, the big bag. And um, one of those bags ended up in the pantry, you know, throw them in cookies, right? And he ingested that in a weekend. That's like 60 portions of M&Ms. And so when you see that, you are all, you're getting your calories. You just... It's in binging. It's it's mm-hmm. it's scary. So he was for twenty years aware of it and trying to trying to do something about it. But but did he think of of like what most people do—the gastric bypass or the band or things like that? Was did he think about doing that? He had two st- surgeries on his stomach. One was a stapling, which stapling. was like before I met him. And when I met him, he was 800 pounds. So the stapling was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. After Last Comic Standing, and now we were together seven years prior to Last Comic Standing. So I was with an 800 pound man. This is my, I I have a lot of my own stuff to figure out. Um, But seven years into the relationship, he got gastric bypass and he lost 300 pounds. Yeah. Uh Um, And it plateaued. And he lost, he lost more than that though. Mm Because I saw him, well... At his sm- smallest, he yeah. was probably maybe five fifty or four fifty, four thirty, maybe. <sighs> four thirty. Wow. But then you know he would bounce between high fours, low fives after the gastric bypass. He he just couldn't get out of that area. And what uh, towards the end of our marriage, I got I was very concerned. He was in and out of the hospital and rehab mm-hmm. for what drug? That's where that's where I think you wanted to hear more. Um, so. Rewind seven years prior. He had he, he was always a pot smoker. There's no secret about that. Um, it heavy help with the food. Heavy, yeah. Okay. And and the hormonal imbalances yeah. and everything. But you know, I mean, pot was a big part of his life, and it helped him with some of the body pain that he had. But what happened was he had pulmonary embolisms. Oh my god! And uh, we, he was on a, a boat going. He was on a cruise ship working, and he had pneumonia. And they took him off the boat on a gurney. It had progressed to the point where he. He was nearly de- dead on the yeah. boat. It was yeah. crazy. And they, they took him to the hospital in Tampa. I flew in and met him. And his feet and fingers were purple. Mm. And they got him on a heparin drip. And that's what saved his life. His sister actually did it for him. She was a nurse. She drove him from Orlando. And they moved him up into the ICU unit. And when he passed the clot, I was in the room with him. He completely stopped breathing. And his pupils were shaking and dilating. Mm. He was seconds from death. Oh and a pulmonologist came in the room and... And they saved his life, and he was lucky that he shouldn't have lived. I think he had the doctor told Taylor like a thirty percent chance of living through that weekend. Um, and then he got out of there, but they said you cannot smoke pot anymore. But here's oxycodone, here's oh Percocet, here's Here we go. Xanax, uh, here's uh, everything else. Oh man, yeah. Uh, and that's when that's when it got bad. Yeah, this sweet person that mm-hmm. I married, that I fell in love with, despite his size and other things that you know, people see physically like that would have probably not been like, because our relationship was so based on, on him and who he was, that shit stripped him of, mm-hmm. I mean, who it, he was. Him yeah, and I mean, who he was. And he was super depressed. And, and from that point on though, literally in the seven years that followed, he was in and out of the hospital every four to six months. He, I think he had 11 hospitalizations and rehab stints in seven years. Oh, his last seven years of life. Oh no. The seven years that we were together. Oh. And then he, what happened was we, we did rehab. Mm-hmm. And I say we because I forced him into rehab, which didn't work. Right. Because, um, you know, $80,000 later. Ugh. And uh, and he didn't What, did he go to Malibu? It. Yeah. Oh, no. Jesus. Yeah. You know, and I think what we were talking about right before we got on, it, you know, I think families are so desperate for yeah. that person to get sober. And that's sober. why these people take advantage of it. Yeah. You will spend yes, I every know it's a bit. Waste. You yeah. can there's places like Cry Help. What's Cry Help cost? For 10, a month. 10,000 bucks. 10, 10, bucks for a month and it's the highest level of care in terms of what they need. What they I want need. to yeah. I want it to stay in rehab. I would go up and visit him and I'd be like I yeah. I want to stay here. It shouldn't yeah. be like that. It was beautiful. Yeah. It should not be like that. The food was so good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I yeah. was like this is crazy. No good. And would yeah. that, did they address his eating problems too? Um, I mean, the whole addiction cycle was supposed was he, to be was addressed. He a, was but he traumatized as a kid? Yeah, I mean, he what had happened? his traumas. Do we know what? That's where things get really cloudy for me because... Um, he didn't even know, probably. Well, he probably didn't tell her. No. Blocks it out, blocks he it told out. Me, he told me things that were 
absolutely horrific that would totally explain his issues. But a year after he left me, I was, his mother was stayed friends with me. She actually, you know, when people split up, it's messy and people try and figure out where do they want to fit into the pieces. So his mother sat me down and she's like, I don't understand why he's doing this to you. And I go, well, maybe it was because of, you know, he was, he's talked about this publicly, so I can share it here. Okay. Um, maybe it was because of his molestation. Molestation! And his story about what, what he said. And she, and she had no knowledge of what he said. And his story was that she was privy to it and took him to the hospital and that he'd gone to court. Like, he had this whole big story mm-hmm. that uh-huh. she absolutely she denied. denied. Mm-hmm. And his sister, too. And then he had this massive car wreck. And he had a car wreck, but it was completely different than what his mother and sister had talked about. Like was he, he taking opiates by the time he told you this no, stuff? No, nope. he told you. Way he maintained before. these stories. I mean, it. I was devastated because for nearly two decades, this was the foundation of who he was and the reasons for. The, I find it all so incredibly confusing. I bet, <laughs> like I, 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 I would love for you to explain. I mean, for literally, I believe these stories for years. And why wouldn't I? If somebody mm-hmm. tells you these things, you just want to hold them. Well, and and I'm sure something happened. Right? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure something happened, but exactly what and what he made of it and why it was manufactured. I mean, memories are notoriously distorted. Yeah. Notoriously. But mom and sisters may have been distorted too. So and somewhere in so there. So different. Especially yeah. com- right. comedians do it a lot where it's hard to tell where the bit ends and the real life begins. Because yes. I've known a lot of comedians that – you don't know that That's their stories yeah. are. I was just going to say, well, waka waka. <laughs> I was bleeding out my butt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> there's no, there was like no gray area in the, like there was no crossover to comedy in these well, stories. But yeah, I know. Like there's the creative mind. Yeah. And exaggeration and the integration. I've seen a lot of comedians do this where they hear a story of a friend of theirs, kid. You know, something happened with that family, integrate it into their own and make it happen like it happened to them. And then they tell the story, the bit so many times that all of a sudden they believe that it really actually happened to them. I believe a thousand percent that he believed the yes, story. That's I just what think I'm saying. He got it off of Law and Order. <laughs> like, uh. I, don't, I don't know where, because it was such a, 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 such a specific story. What, and, what did he, do you mind me asking what he said? Uh, I mean, the car wreck has been. So, I mean, I was devastated. The car wreck story, he told me his whole life. Basically, he, and he t- he's told it on other places. And I don't want to, like, shit bag on him at all. That's not my yeah, my no, goal. No. But basically, he'd had a car accident in which he'd gotten hit by a drunk driver. And the car ran off an embankment. And he broke 62 bones or, like, 72 separate breaks or something. He was in a coma. Now, see, the reason I was sort he's of... He's a uh, doctor. That can't have happened. Well, no. Yeah. That's the reason I want to <laughs> assess. Because I can tell you what sort of... What sounds right and what doesn't sound right. This sounds like that is some huge embellishment of something. Well, here's... I don't know what. Here's what happened. Maybe if I were a betting man, I'd say maybe he was drinking and maybe something like that happened. So the the story... Something happened, though, for but sure. Something happened yes. and there was a car accident. It was a car accident. And after 17 years of the story, I'm sitting on the couch talking to his mother and she goes... He ran off the road in a truck. There was another guy in the car with him. He flipped the vehicle into a empty lot. They were driving to go get alcohol yeah. to sell it at, at a Boy Scouts party <laughs> or some, something like that. Whoa. And um, he told her the truck. <laughs> he broke his clavicle. Yeah. And uh, and that was basically it. And then, oh, her she got sued by the other kid's mother. Yeah. And the, her insurance policy ended up having to pay out. And... When I heard this story, I was crying. That sounds closer to reality. Yeah, that sounds, that closer, sounds closer to reality. Yeah. Well, I turned to his sister who was in the room and I said, Melanie, what happened? Where were you? And she said, well, I was driving back to college. And I said, well, she's – and she's the RN that came down and helped with the heparin and yeah. helped save his life. I yeah. said, well, what what happened? And she goes, Lana, if he'd have had a, a stint in his brain – He'd have to have been life flown into Little Rock because there ain't no neurosurgeons in Clarksville, Arkansas. And I was just like, oh, like 17 years Did of me. Did you feel lied to? I felt, I yes. I, but I mean, I was. Well, you know what it sounds like? It sounds wait, like, wait, wait. Did you feel manipulated into that was part of his stick to get you? To I, marry you? No, I mean, I don't know. I would have loved him no matter Drew. what. Like, I, I just, I think. 
look, I, again, I don't want to like sit here and be like Ralphie, but like no, I, well, listen, I love Ralphie in any flavor. Yes. Yeah. You can't, there's nothing you can say well, that's going to diminish my feelings about him and right. what he did for the world and his audiences. Mm-hmm. He's the one that suffers. Right. It's because of his own suffering that he did whatever he did with you. And he sounds like somebody. He reminds me of histrionic patients. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's there, histrionic patients will sometimes come up with these tremendous. See, well, what does I that mean, histrionic? It's I wonder, a certain kind of personality structure. But then we we want to try to you know we we want to pathologize like what this is yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we want because we want to understand it. Yeah. Right, right. I yeah. do too. That happens. Yeah, to, we don't want to. But I deal it. with okay. Ralphies yeah. all the time, and and at a certain point, it gets exhausting trying to figure out what what the truth is. Yes. Yeah. You have to just say, I don't know what the truth is, but I love the person I anyway. love the person anyway. I love the person anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the truth is. Yeah. And then we don't feel so defensive because yeah. because we get lied to every day. <laughs> yeah, we like, like constantly, constantly. The best one so, was a kid told us, this is back when we had a treatment center together. A kid told us that he was an Iraqi veteran and oh. told us all these horrendous things yeah. he had done. And I'm just an old junkie and I was like, that kid don't look old enough to go to right. Iraq. Remember right, that? Right. Yeah. And, no, but, it still But happens. Dr. Plum and happens. you both believe that we're, oh, and they, we had a yeah. PTSD yeah. expert come down. Right. Finally, like you talked to uh, Ravi's mother, I talked to this kid's mother and I said, so, so how long was he in the service? And she said, what He's service? <laughs> But, but you have to, and we but, had him but, having a PTSD therapist. And, and so to wow. me, I just kind of shake my head. I don't feel <laughs> violated by that. It's like, oh, jeez. <laughs> it, it, my thing is like, oh, how insecure must you feel about yourself? Me? To, no, no. Or him? him yeah. Or this kid to have to concoct these stories that you think we need to hear in order to connect to you and to feel okay and you know f- feel and sorry for you. And that's what we, you. you feel, that yeah. connection. I want to relieve that sadness and that fr- that fear from the person, right? We, we and reassure a, them. We've got to take a break. You have an Indiegogo account. You want to tell us about that? Yeah. Um, um, oh, I was going to punctuate what you just said, too, by saying that I feel like everything with Ralph was, like, larger than life. Yeah. Like he was a well, big that's, person. That's the yeah. Yeah. And everything was big and wonderful, like, yeah. and fun. And so, yeah, I mean, there were times where I was like, you're full of shit. Like, I know you're lying to me right now, but you kind of just make a pass because, you know, like, it's – it's got a great reward. He, well, what had, were his comedian role models? I'm assuming Richard Pryor, like Freddie Kennison Prince, and all, yeah. Kennison. These are not the greatest role models <laughs> in the world. Not in life, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you know what Ralphie could do that I've never seen anybody else do quite? He could. He's like an orchestra. He's like he's like an orchestra leader. The audience was like his orchestra, and he could literally like make waves go mm-hmm. through it. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a Talent. group. I've never seen that. I just, I was like, and I was affected by it too. I was laughing and laughing my ass off. But I would literally, he would just like, like a, like a maestro taking a huge group of people and making them do what he wanted them to do. The craziest thing I've ever seen. What's going So we want to talk about the documentary and uh-huh. the Indiegogo. Okay. And then we're going to say goodbye to Periscope. Okay. Bye Periscope. But after we yeah. talk about that, because okay. I want people to know about your Paris. Your okay. The, okay. The documentary. Um, yeah. So like Ralph left this incredible gift and it's a really long story how we've gotten to this point but um but he left a one hour special behind um we did a documentary i said we um ralphie was involved in in trying to do this thing so we asked about the the weight loss surgeries he had wanted to get lap band a third surgery i was at a, i was so against it uh because he'd already had two prior surgeries but and he's a he had clots and all oh god be, i was really so risk. against yeah, it yeah. but I bet you can always find a doctor that'll do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was like, can we just put duct tape over your mouth? Like, what's the difference when you keep cutting up your intestines? You know? So, anyways, we, I, but I began to recognize that anything we could do to get the weight off his body, because I told him, I said, you, you'll be dead in two years. We have to do something. Yeah. And so I, I will, I will move forward with you and we, I will help you through this lap band. And, and then I hired, and he helped as well. He wanted to do it. We hired our friend, Catherine, Kat Reinhardt, and we started to film him in this weight loss journey, which clearly didn't work. And actually, insurance would not pay for it. And oh, yeah. so it became yeah. a question of him just doing it on his own, which he didn't want to do it on his own, yeah. which is why he wanted the lap band, which wouldn't have worked anyways. So um, in the process of recording this journey, we also recorded a ton of stand-up. And so we have this amazing collection of bits that we can put together for people who, so we can give one last one hour special. And then we have this documentary, which is in the final phases of being edited. It's almost done. And um, we're trying to do crowdfunding to finish the rest of it. Cause believe it or not, his accounts were empty when he passed, mm. which is a whole nother story about addiction and enablers. Mm. Um, 
But yeah, so I'm. Was looking, he giving money to people and stuff? Oh like my God. God. He had like two hundred and sixty dollars in his personal account oh when he died, God. and uh, yeah, that's a whole nother story. And you would be in the documentary, except one of his, the worst person, like that came into his our lives and like messed everything up, actually took off with some of the hard drives, and so oh, we man. actually came in to your Radio show, show about three years and some change ago. Yeah, and one of the hard drives was. Us in, your, in the in radio studio. I remember that because yeah. that's the only time I'd ever met you was at the radio studio until I saw you the other night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe we have, have the audio somewhere. Oh, uh, you probably do. Yeah, without doubt, you would have the audio. Maybe but we can find out. Yeah, but, I mean, we have like this whole hard drive that that this guy based. I mean, it's a really long story, but he's one of the people who stepped into Rafi's life and like and mm. caused a lot of problems. But the enablers are fascinating. Me, but um, should, should we? So, but anyways, they're, Indiegogo. Well, they're exploiters. Well, well, Let's call them what they are. They're the exploiters. They're yeah. not enablers. As what much is as the exploiters? What is the Indiegogo? So I don't have the Indiegogo account name right now but um because we haven't actually launched the, the link but it's going to be up on indiegogo and it's ralphie may and if you follow social media you can I'll, we'll be posting everything we're, i believe we're starting july 10th what's your what's your say twitter handle just lana turner l-a-h-n-a turner t-u-r-n-e-r okay. well you've heard me speak about the supplement bergamot for about two years now and most recently their sport formulation which helps reduce inflammation shortening workout muscle recovery time but I want to come back to the formula that originally got me excited about the brand. That is the Bergamot Mega Plus. Yep, the Mega Plus O uses key extract from the Bergamot citrus fruit. It's a unique fruit, extremely rich in polyphenols. They've been shown to reduce the risk of heart disease, polyphenols. And Bergamot Mega Plus O works like a natural statin, right? For these medications you use to lower cholesterol. Well, this works in precisely the same way. In addition, though, it addresses another condition called metabolic syndrome, which is abdominal fat, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, high blood pressure, insulin resistant, metabolic syndrome. It helps with that. It also helps with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, physicians can recommend different pharmaceuticals for these conditions, but Bergamet Mega Plus O offers the all-natural solution. Cardiologists and physicians worldwide do recommend Bergamet. Its effectiveness is the subject of many scientific publications. I've taken it myself. I have recommended and have patients on it right now. And for a limited time, Bergamet is offering our listeners 25% off any of the supplements by entering the code DRDRW at checkout. That is Dr. Drew, all one word, at checkout. To learn more, visit bergamet.com. That is B-E-R-G-A-M-E-T, B-E-R-G-A-M-E-T.com. And remember that use that code, Dr. Drew, at checkout. We only have one rule at a Ralphie May show. That's to have a good time. So who here is ready to have a good fucking time? You know who you need to see. Put your hands together for Mr. Ralphie. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. How are you? Thank you for the, the water rats. <laughs> I'm making sure I don't drown. <laughs> My aunt said it wasn't always a lesbian. She'd been married for 10 years to a son of a bitch. He was an asshole, he hit her, but she couldn't make breakfast, I see both sides. <laughs> My agent called me up, right, and uh, he goes, are you sitting down? And I go, uh, always. <laughs> yeah, I'm flying upside down, I can't take your call right now. I apologize, ma'am, I'll get to uh, jokes you approve of. <laughs> Tasting pussy meat, bitch. I smell a soapy vagina. I'll make you put your clothes back on and run around the block four or five times. I ain't got no time. Those big dog titties, they weren't droopy at all. They were perky. Fucking great. Big monstrous titty. With my favorite nipples, the baloney fadeaways. I love those nipples. Providence white people look down on fucking East Providence white people look down on North Providence white people. It's a little sizzle from what's coming, right? 
that's a little sizzle of the stand-up. You see, each little chunk is from a different city, and he was so good. Every time he would go to a new town, he would riff for the first, you know, 15, 20 minutes about where he was. Would he go do a little research? Would he walk around? And No, he was, you know, he was just, just pick so it up and just good. absorb it, yeah. He was, I mean, look, he'd been doing stand-up his, half of his life, and he could just... More than half of his life. So. But still, that whole riff he did about uh, Providence and all the different <laughs> regions, I mean, how did he know that? He's so smart. Yeah. Ralphie was so smart. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he could just pick up on stuff. And hence the ability to, like, win people over and still charismatic. And, and I, manipulate and do all those good yeah. things, too. <laughs> well, yeah. So. I mean, I, I fell in love with a really smart guy. Yeah. Just really troubled. But, yeah. Yeah. They so. usually are. Yes. <laughs> and we're all a little messed up. I mean, I know I'm fucked up too. I mean, it's just all part of the whole thing, right? So, What are you doing for you to get over all this? I've been consistently going to therapy for like a year and a half. Um, I, I found the Maple Center, which oh, is great. It's very good. Very good. It's structured so that you can afford it. Because yeah. that's one of the things about therapy, man. Like you go to a therapist and you leave there and you're like, that was an hour of my life and I could have gone on an airplane and I could be in like, a, mm-hmm. you know. I could be in Cuba. <laughs> like yeah, I could yeah. be do- doing a totally different kind of therapy right now. Um, whereas not to not to shit back on anything because any help you can get. But I mean, you can't afford to go every week. Whereas at Maple Center, I, they require you to go every week, and you can afford it. So, and are they doing groups still at Maple? I'm at sure. Maple? I'm sure they do. Are they, they doing a- group therapy? As I well? did a group parenting class. Okay, and they, I they've did- got a lot of lot of different programs. Yeah. They got okay. some stuff for your yeah. children too. I, my kids go every week, and okay. then we did some family therapy too with the kids. And also okay. another cool thing that I found for the kids is, and and they have group for p- adults, but I haven't been able to go. Is our house, which is a grief a grief center that help people with mourning. And my kids went to Camp Aaron this summer, which is amazing. So it's for all the children that um, that were at this camp lost either a parent or a sibling in the last three years. Wow. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then wow. this weekend yeah. we're going to a Dodgers game because the Dodgers sponsor Camp Aaron and mm-hmm. our house, so they give away tickets. So the kids wow. will be with their ki- oh, friends cool. from their cabin. Oh my god, that's oh, cool. great! It's so great. How old are the kids? Um, my son just turned nine, and my hey, daughter's ten. By the 10. way, good on yeah. you for going out and finding the right yeah. services and stuff and affordable. So that's why I always tell people there's affordable stuff out there, but you yeah. have to do the legwork. You do How, it. How'd you find yeah. out about it? Uh, f- another widow. <laughs> there's like, I mean, I just met, I no. Meet that's people important. And... You find out from the people who know. Yeah, who've been through Everybody it. Everybody thinks yep. they're going to look at call the back of their insurance card and the magical things are going to happen. Yeah. It's not. You mm-hmm. have to be vulnerable and talk to people and and reach out to communities and people don't want to do that or i mean right now maybe there's somebody out there who just heard that Mm -hmm. because i didn't know that existed somebody had to tell me and 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 then and then you have to take the initiative to apply i mean there was an application process you know they they do a phone interview and in-person interviews where'd you grow up uh canada yeah. Then Texas. Don't you right. want to move back at this point? To Canada? Yeah. <laughs> Politically? <laughs> yeah, I mean, though, it's cold there. <laughs> what, what part? The only drawback. Um, I was born in a place called Sarnia, which is a small town in Ontario, and then raised in Toronto, and then moved to Texas when I was like 13, where mm-hmm. I met Ralph. But I don't, I try not, I love Texas, but I don't really claim it anymore. I'm so LA, I hate myself. Mm-hmm. I love LA. Like, <laughs> Don't give up your Toronto roots. Uh, tr- yeah, I'm Canadian. Kids in the hall are from Toronto. Yeah, no, can, can, I'm, I'm, Canadian Californian at this point. But what I was mean, your comedian heroes? Oh my god! Well, I play I play music on the guitar, so yeah. you know I I really love. So if I was to like aspire to different Steve Martin, yeah, he's amazing. Um, believe it or not, Rodney Carrington is one of my favorite comedy songwriters, and people don't give him enough credit for as brilliant as his songwriting is. I yeah. mean, he has some funny songs, but uh, I I'm a big fan of comedy. I I mean, I feel like. I mean, I can watch an open mic and crack up at well, somebody. Well, so. just so you, when you say the word Toronto, to me, it's kids in the hall. Yes. Because I was in a band, and I remember we played the Elma Combo, which is the most famous club there in history. The Rolling Stones played there, Elvis Costello. And I was walking from the bus, and two of the kids in the hall guys were going to the guest list, and I was like, holy fucking <laughs> <laughs> It was one of the greatest moments of my life. <laughs> like, all right? Because if you're, I've just been a comedy fan since I was like seven or eight, and I wanted to be a stand-up, but I was too scared. It's Aww. too weird of a do it job. now. I've been thinking about it. Get on stage. It's so well, much fun. It's never too late. It's become sort of the they are kind of the current rock stars, right? That's kind of yeah, what, they are the that same impulse. That well, same impulse. Kevin Hardis. <laughs> well, but no, but I mean, <laughs> there's, one, there's one current rock star. No, no, I don't mean just in terms of how they're perceived. I mean in terms of what the impulse was to be a rock star. It's yeah. a similar impulse. It you is. Got there. Yeah, that's oh, so, 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 so like people now. want to be stand up, huh? 
I think that's it's a similar impulse now. It's 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 sort of an antisocial impulse at its core, right? At least a lot of people theorize that. But it's wanting to hold an audience and make a difference, and you know, commune with influence people. the culture, influence and the stuff culture. Like that. Yeah, it's so much fun. And I mean, as far as rock star lifestyle goes, I mean, I I was just in Vegas last night. I mean, and did you perform? Yeah, yeah. And I definitely like. I am not a mom when I'm on the road and I, I'm so responsible all the time that I get to actually, when I get on the road, I get to be irresponsible and stupid. So let's, a lot of people at home don't know, and we've talked about it a couple of times. So it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? To do, do the gigs? To, yeah. So you're on by yourself, but usually if you do improvs or whatever, you the do improv, Thursday, Wednesday Friday, through Saturday, Sunday, depends. Wednesday through Sunday, depends. two shows on Saturday. Uh-huh. So seven shows through the total. Sometimes stand. two shows Friday, two shows Saturday, depends so, on. Right? Yeah. All by yourself. You maybe have somebody go with you. It's not like being in a band no. where you got 20 other people around right. you to be are, a are part of. Are you watching of. I'm Dying Up Here? The yes. Series I have been able to watch it, but yeah, yeah. yeah it's a, but is there it? is a community you're a part of is why I bring that up. But but it is a lot of drinking because because yeah. a lot of the casualties of comedy were acquaintance of mine like Hedberg. And right. You know, like, it's so sad because you get sober – and then you're going to go be lonely by yourself around people who want to drink and take drugs with you, right? Yeah. Oh, listen, it's, Louis in his series explored that a bit, right? Yeah, but yeah. he's not a drug addict, though. Well, but it was he was talking about the alcohol and stuff. And Every alcohol. comic is. Do you feel obligated up, to drink? <laughs> um, I well, sometimes you do. So I started stand up in Houston, and I wandered into the la- old laugh stop there, and there was some of the funniest comics I've ever seen. At, live in that town yeah. and their careers never went anywhere because of alcohol and their inability to leave that, that bubble. And, uh, so watching that, I decided that I would not drink in clubs. Wow. Because. Wow. Yeah. yeah but you're, you're Jew, you're Ashkenazi Jew, right? Yeah. So there's not so much alcohol genetics there. So it's easier. So for you can make that rule. Yes. Yeah. That's the point. But. That's the point. Last night in Vegas, after well, after my set, because I also I I like to be on stage. I like to be coherent. Like it was any time I've gone on stage, a little bit buzzed. I I have a hard time keeping. No, but my it's focus. usually from from twelve thirty till four in the morning is what I'm talking about. It's, in the venues, afterwards. yeah, afterwards the drinking, yeah, and drugs. Bob's, I'm rom- Bob's actually drugs. actively romanticizing <laughs> this right now. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> I was one time. Let me tell you my best Kinison story. So I'm at Duke's next to the whiskey. Mm-hmm. We're all like in awe of Kinison. Yeah, a bunch of musicians. We all idolize comedians. Ironically, <clears throat> so he walks in so fucked up at like 10 o'clock in the morning and he's you know they had bench tables and he sat right across from me and ak Mm -hmm. and we're just like and we want to talk to him and he just ordered something and then he took something out and poured a drink and he drank it and he just put his head down on the table and fell asleep inside the restaurant oh my god and we're like holy fuck yeah that's right that sounds familiar (laughs) 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 um but yeah but like uh, well, for me, I Did was Ralphie very, do that yeah, stuff? Yeah, but I, I, towards the end, yeah. But yeah, I mean, plus that terrible sleep apnea, though, Ralph. Ra- well, he got tested for it and had it, but refused to use uh. the machines. I, I, I was married for the majority of my career, and, and then I've had, you know, I had two small babies, and I would be out on the road with them, and I had a husband that took a lot of work to mm-hmm. take care of, and just to navigate and maintain all those different plates in the air were different than now, so... So as of now, when I go on the road, it's a completely different thing and a little bit more frightening in terms of what you're talking about because I'm, I have the ability to be irresponsible on the road <laughs> and do things that I'm like, okay, I need to be careful because mm-hmm. of my, you know, I, <laughs> I just, I, I had a lot of fun last night. <laughs> oh, you feel a little yeah, guilty. Not last don't night, the feel, night before. No, don't feel guilty for having fun. Yeah, no, I just have to be careful because I, it is, there's accessibility. Like, I mean, people become accessible and things become accessible. I mean, I don't, I'm not a pot smoker, but before I get on stage, I've had, I get joints put in my hand and in my pockets and, mm-hmm. um, 
and that's awesome. <laughs> you know, you so. ever do Upright Citizens Brigade? You ever been there? Those I have guys not. smoke pot before they go out and do the most yeah. amazing I shit. Yeah. I, I don't know how they do it. I, I watched them smoke pot. I'm like, you guys are about to go out without a net for an hour and a half, yeah. and you're going to be stoned on pot. And they're like, fuck yeah. <laughs> okay. do, you, do you do improv in addition to stand-up? I've done improv yeah. when I first start, started comedy, but I, I love stand-up because I felt like with improv, at the end of the night, if it doesn't go well, you've got five other people to blame. But if I'm a, and doing stand-up, if anything goes wrong, I can figure out how to fix it for the next time, and it's just me. And I love that. I, and I'm also I'm the only one writing it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a comic. But, uh, yeah, and it's such it's a great fun, expression though. of, you know, your whole history going out onto that stage. And that's what I love about comics is the honesty. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty honest about everything. I don't have a filter. I so. thought you were pretty brave. Well, I, I think, you. I uh-huh. think the natural comparison is Sarah Silverman, right? Is that you, they People must, you must get that. People will because she plays I, guitar and yeah, she's Jewish. But it's actually very different. I, yeah. I, 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 see I, the, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, very that, different. I see the sometimes difference. Sometimes oh, cool. I feel but like I, Sarah is is playing a character. I don't think it's her. Really. Oh, it's not her. Yeah. It's yeah, a piece I of her. It's a piece of her. Yeah, but, but I mean. it, not like really bearing it all out there. There's all different types of confessional comedy and, and who I am. You know, Louis C.K. is that person. Yeah. There's no separation. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm. Except for his obsessive obsession about jokes. I've never seen anybody so disciplined about putting a stand-up routine together. Right. A lot of comedians are that way, right? Yeah, I mean... You saw Aziz do that. We went to the Comedy Cellar together last year. Yeah. And literally, we walked upstairs, and they just got done. Aziz had his notepad out, and he's like, obviously did not want to socialize. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? How is it with amongst comedians with you? And you're probably uh, around mostly boys, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean... Is it competitive? I, I Well, a lot of... Comics are competitive. I don't feel competitive with most people because I just I feel like if somebody's got something and they're successful, then maybe that can happen for me as well. And also, I don't I don't have room for that. I, like I said, I've been super busy all these years, just with basically being a single mom. I mean, even when Rafi was around, I was a single mom, so trying to raise two babies and do stand up, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. But so I've never felt competitive. No, I mean. But I, I love telling comedy, but where I'm different from when I get on stage to where I get off is I'm kind of introverted. When, mm. And um, I always was. And my friends who knew me growing up, I actually, my previous career, I was a photographer. I used to shoot uh, for news and wire services. So, I mean, I would wear a baseball cap and hide and try and take pictures of what was going on around me and not, not outgoing. So when I'm on stage, though, I get to kind of project. Be another part of you. I'm- yeah, that can come out. But then when I get off stage, I, I'm baseball cap more so <laughs> and then so it's wild like people are like you know i've been invited to have three subs with people off stage and i'm like wait that was an act like i'm not gonna go <laughs> have sex with you but maybe now i can <laughs> so if you're comfortable i want to drill a little bit into you you sort of glossed over your own piece of the of your relationship with ralphie okay. and i'm wondering if there's stuff in therapy you're going over or things that you could share that other people would learn go ahead sure I mean, in because the, you really glossed that. You went like, "Well, I have my own stuff," and then psh, 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 gone. <laughs> Let's not deal with it. Um, in I well, watching the documentary, I was it blew my mind because I realized why Ralphie left me. I mean, I was the I'm literally the poster child for codependency in this. You were thing. controlling, and I was trying to control everything, mm-hmm. and that I just it surpassed logic. Did you how, grow up in that kind of a family system? What do you mean as far as like codependent? Controlling. Or? Maybe so. I but don't know. But you laid it out well, to him, if you recall. You said I, I, that very first meeting. Listen, if you want me to help you. I will never stop. I will never stop. You told him before you even started dating. Yeah, I but, did. But what kind of family did you grow up in? Was there any religious um, Not, intensity or anything? No. Or? I mean, I grew up with in a very reformed Jewish household. So reformed. Very reformed, yeah. I mean... We, we Were they at one time very? Did they know the difference no. between Hanukkah and Passover? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but not I, that reform. But you know, no candles on Friday and no yeah. no kosher, like nothing like that. Just you know, they. We I had some Jewish exposure, but nothing nothing too serious. But I think there's an addiction cycle in my family. Like oh. my grandmother, you know, she didn't have a pill problem. She just you know liked to 
she she's like to eat them and wash them down with vodka. You know? Oh yeah, That's yeah. Good. yeah, yeah. She, yeah things no like problem. that. No makes problem. Them, makes them work better. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She just she doesn't have a problem taking them. She just puts them in her so, mouth and swallows them. So there was you. You became codependent of some of the people around you, and then just brought that over to Ralphie. Maybe so. I I mean I my mom. I love my mom. I have a great mom, but she was very. She had every possible sickness or illness Mm -hmm. my entire childhood Mm -hmm. and it got to the point where she'd be like laying in bed and she'd be like i'm dying tonight and i'd be like okay okay so i'm I'm out the door so that's histrionic Mm -hmm. right remember i said yeah and so that did she really have the illnesses or was she no No. okay so i just wanted to clear that up make sure if she had all the the illnesses (laughs) she's 70s now so oh, she's okay so she <laughs> didn't have the illnesses have okay but but eventually you will get some but, but it but feels again, like I'm, i don't want to say anything bad about my mom because no, it break her heart but we, we don't we don't think about these no, things no, as no. pejorative no, no, we no, just okay. think of them as just sort of descriptive and we give them labels helps us understand them but that sounds histrionic and so you might have been attached to a histrionic person and then found another histrionic person to attach yourself to yeah and, and codependents work like this because i'm both so i need to be loved and my mode of operation to be needed is to solve other people's problems. Mm-hmm. Ralphie's is need, needs to be loved, and his is to be pathetic and need oh help. Oh my god! And you fit. Well, not There's pathetic. A it, it, meaning no, I get in, it. In need. Yes. There's a fittedness. Yeah. It's it feels like magic and, and then there's when another you find that person we were fit so with. connected yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. there's another layer to it too which is codependents tend to have bad boundaries and so when you when the other person is having pain or something emotional you see that as something special on the inner child that's so injured and blah 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 it's actually not even his it's yours Oh. It's actually your stuff getting mobilized. <laughs> yeah, it's just, but, it's just but, an activation. Uh, it's just an activation yeah. of your stuff, but it feels like you're seeing something special in them. Even, and they are having pain and stuff, and they're having these things, but the, the intensity and stuff is all actually yours. But I think that that love is real. Yeah, I agree. But you, can, you need to get healthy, and it seems like he was trying but couldn't. And you well, let's you, let reemphasize that because people don't talk about that. I think you're right. There's I, I, a way to to have that be real love, and as you, yeah. as you grow together, you become more healthy, and you allow each other to have better Separate. boundaries yeah, and yeah. separation. And that's what ideally marriage and family therapy is supposed to do, or even individual it, therapy too. You could do right. two individuals and get the same place. And the example being, in, in, if. I give you. A, I know this is maybe painful, but if Ralphie had gotten sober and lost weight, and got down to like three hundred, a manageable weight, you would have thought problems solved. They wouldn't have because you still have your stuff that you would have had to resolve, right? You were so focused on him resolving your his problems. Well, but but by right? the way, when you but. You're not you're not as good as a codependent as we are. A really good codependent would go. He's going to gain it back. I got to stay on him. <laughs> Problem never solved. Problem never solved. Oh yeah. my god, you guys are blowing my mind. I mean, yeah, I well, the whole desire to be loved thing. Oh, I have an insatiable appetite and need to be loved, which mm-hmm. hence stand up because that's a total drug in itself is getting on stage and receiving the love of an audience, and then in my life. When I meet somebody, I I immediately love them so much, and I want that love, love in return. Love yeah, addicted. and that's tough. Like you I gotta re- be read really any careful. P. Melody stuff. I have no idea what that. Is. You guys are blowing my mind. This is like textbook. We'll have you in a We'll have you. We'll have you. Let her grieve. Like sit in the corner. Let her grieve first and get solid with that. And I'm just saying. It's it's just, yeah, yeah. This is not unfamiliar territory to us. Yeah, but we I do already, this all the time. Yeah. That's why we're like I'm publicly. Oh, I already knew was... because you know yourself and you know you could fall in love really quickly, but in your own mind. It's not enough time yet, or something like that. Yeah. Right? You mean time away? F- well, yeah. Look, I, this something, is something you just described it in Vegas. Like I don't know, I could, I could <laughs> fall in love, but I won't. Well, you know, I, the some of the, the favors that Ralphie did that were hor- like not favors at all, but for me they were good. Is that he left me, and it was I had almost two years. So I it took me like eight months. Yeah, but you're to, seeing him every. All the time no. with kids, no. you're seeing them all no, the time. No, he didn't see his children. Oh god! So yeah, Since he it, was sick. So he 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 didn't come around. I mean, so okay, he left. The, he filed for divorce twice. 
by the way. He filed mm-hmm. once, and I, I took him back, and we tried to get back together. And, and then he filed secretly, and I don't know why, but I found the filing. And then I mm-hmm. returned filing out of California because I was like, you can't file once. Uh-uh. I'll file twice. Okay. I get it. Like, yeah. so um, – and he, by the way, the first time he filed was on the heels of like an oxycodone withdrawal. Mm-hmm. And the people that took him were the people – to the divorce attorney were the people who also carried him all the way to the end of his life. Yeah. So it was a really mm-hmm. messed up situation. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so we – it got so ugly that I just – I had to cut him off from me. Mm-hmm. Never cut him off from his children. He could be – the only thing that I maintained was that somebody had to help him with the kids because physically – what you described with Kennison with him falling asleep at mm-hmm. the table, that was Ralphie to a T. He would mm-hmm. he would pass out. And the children are young and they can't yeah. be around him by themselves. They need somebody that can help. And then some of the people that were around Ralphie also were not healthy people that Let I wanted to kids. Let me ask you. So I, you talk about this inner circle that was enabling him or whatever. I just think mm-hmm. probably exploiting him. But he had a lot of friends, and they all knew what was going on. Did any of them try to intervene, try to align with you? we got to fucking do something about him. Or, or yes. was he lying and hiding no, so good? The, so, oh, no. Yeah. People no. talked to no, me about it. No, I, didn't, I, I don't even know the guy. People would talk to me about it and then not have anything to tell me. They just go, well, I just know something. No, I was that, told he was on drugs. I yeah, but then you, if you ever ask him about exactly what's going on, they just go, well, I don't know, something. Something's up. So. Well, his good friends. I don't even know the guy. I knew he was on prescription drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he, I knew he was on prescription yeah. drugs. I don't even remember where I heard it exactly. Probably. There was a TMZ where he got wasted on stage in Colorado, and then they claimed it was weed, but it wasn't weed. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. But so here's why I ask. We've been trying to start this thing called Comedy Cares for years. As each comedian dies of drugs, drugs or suicide we all get together and we go we got to start this thing and then then it all just fades away and it never happens we need to join the community the the comedy community together to have a drug and alcohol awareness and outreach and treatment and groups for comedians i wonder if we come in under music cares and i think i'm asking if you want to do it because we're gonna do it and and the ralphie died how long ago in October. Yeah, like yeah. So we were. That was that night. We were over at yeah. that other comedian's house. What was that guy's name? We were doing a the, podcast. The Thirty days he hadn't taken drugs for. Bert Kreischer. Yeah, oh, Bert Kreischer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were at his house, and they went to the memorial. Yeah. We talked about it then in October. Now recently, you know, there's been more talk about it because there's been some over. Let's go redo. Let's go go do Bert's again. And we we'll, got we'll it. Push him on. We got to get. But we need buy-in from the comedy community, right? Yeah, you know, you know who would be great to get involved in this, which would probably fix a lot of the problem, would be not so much the comics, but the managers and agents, mm. because that's what, who's like, starting it. Well, that's who's doing good, it. Because I mean, I'll tell you what, they. It's easy for a comic to to go on the road because every gig they do, you're going to get 10%. So there's like no incentive to pull this person off no, the road No, there's and a get lot sober. of managers who have a lot of dead comedians. Yes. And they want to start something. It's That'd coming from that part of the industry. But we I, we already did this in the, in the 90s with musicians. It takes musicians. It took me and the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Bonnie Raitt and a bunch of people to get with yeah. the treatment professionals mm-hmm. and the managers and the record companies to come together and build it, build a well, thing. I heard Lana say she's in. So she's yeah, in. that'd so be fun. We're going to do it. Yeah. So I'm handing you a... A little book referral. Okay. <laughs> so, melody, me a bit of a melody. Yeah, Facing yeah. love addiction. It's a really good one. It's a really good book. Okay. What about, you like the first hundred what pages. About the, what about the old, uh, the old standards of codependent no more? And codependent. Uh, it, this, yeah. this gets at all that same stuff. It's just yeah. she has a great way Have of writing. Ever, I, but I'm saying you've read those, haven't you? Uh, yeah. No, I read Codependent No More, which I was like everything in there describes everybody. Yeah, and yeah. Then, <laughs> you're you're going to like. I tell you. What actually that book led me that like there was um one thing and there was like you've got to put yourself first and do something for yourself so while I was reading that book I I just we were in Vegas and the kids were very little and I was like and they said to allow the person that is the addict to have responsibility Mm -hmm. so I was like we're in a hotel I'm I'm gonna we had free access to the spa so I said to him I said I'm gonna go down to the spa for three hours I'm gonna get a facial and a massage and let you play with the kids and you can take them to a movie you can take them bowling because it's all inside the casino it was at South Point and so 
I went down to the spa. I come back three hours later. He's passed out, and the kids had cut each other's hair with scissors they'd found in the – yeah. And I was like – I was okay. like, a few codependent. That doesn't work. No more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I cannot right. leave my children alone yeah. in a hotel – like a contained environment. I, yes. So you'll like this better. <laughs> <laughs> I, that did not work. <laughs> you'll like this better. It's more, more theoretical. Yeah, it's more okay, theoretical. Good. I'll that. definitely uh, look into yeah. it. All right. Well, listen, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And Thank everyone, you. go see the stand-up special. Is it, can, we, we saw it on Amazon. Can you get it anywhere? Which special? My special? Your special, yeah. Right now it's on Amazon um, yeah. and iTunes. It's it's coming back out on – they're going to re-release it on, on a new platform. The distribution company went out of business, but I'm working on a new one hour. And the – Indiegogo will be up and running well by the time this comes out. Great. So go to All Indiegogo right. and or Lana Turner dot you know my stuff on social media. All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you. you. Oh, yeah. Podcast. I forgot. Oh to yeah, say. don't forget. Oh the yeah, podcast. the podcast. Yeah, Perfect like... Ten Podcast too. And oh. since all your listeners are into podcasts, what is it called again? That. The um, Perfect Ten Podcast, and it, it's really fun. Usual platforms. Usual platforms. Okay. We'll see you there. Perfect Perfect Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye. All right, that's about it for this episode of This Life. Check us out at KBC, B and uh, Lawrence Vaughn, 790 Midday Live, Talk Radio, Monday to Friday. You can also tune in every day live via the magic of the internet at kbc.com. If you miss it, we've made it simple for you to find all the shows at drdrew.com, the Adam and Dr. Drew podcast, the Sync One I Do By Myself, Dr. Drew podcast, This Life, of course, with Bob Swole Patrol, Mike Cantho at his new health and fitness podcast. You can uh, find us on Twitter at This Life Podcast, at Dr. Drew, Derry W, at Rehab Bob Forrest, and of course, our lovely producer at First Lady of Love. I think I know who that is. If you love this show, please subscribe and tell a friend. We appreciate it when you do. We'd love to hear your feedback as well. Send us a message. Join the email list at drdrew.com, drdrew.com slash contact. You'll also get a weekly uh, email from us on that. Uh, while you're at it, at doctor.com, please support our sponsors by clicking through the banners. We only advertise products that I can get behind. So thank you for supporting them, those that support us. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.